on practically every social problem, individualism is blamed. Social fragmentation, it's seen to be as a consequence of too much individualism. The idea of the individual taking precedence over social issues, the idea of the kind of Thatcherite notion of the individual is now seen to be very problematic. After the riots, it was blamed on a me, me, me society. And so individualism is very much in the dock as being problematic. The thing that slightly concerned me and that I wanted to think about was, obviously, I don't want to live in a society full of selfish individuals who have no regard for each other. And I traditionally am from a political background that has great regard for collective action and social solidarity. But I also have great regard for individual autonomy, the capacity for us to act as individuals in our, and uh, great respect for free will. And I felt that there was a danger of the baby getting thrown out with the bathwater, that when we attacked individualism, we ended up attacking uh, individual autonomy. First person who's going to speak is uh, Clifford Longley. Clifford is a leader, writer, and columnist and editorial consultant at The Tablet. He's a regular contributor to Thought of the Day. He's a panelist, along with myself, on the BBC Radio 4's Moral Maze. Clifford has been a consultant to the Catholic Bishops' Conference of England and Wales for drafting the common good and the Catholic Church's social teaching and the Catholic Church and human rights. I think next up is going to be Bruno Waterfield, who has been at the Battle of Ideas and spoken on many occasions. He has been the Brussels correspondent for the Daily Telegraph since December 2006. Prior to that, he had wide experience of reporting in, on British politics and European affairs. He's the author of No Means No, a fantastic book about uh, Europe, which if you haven't read, you should read. And very importantly for me, he's somebody who, when he speaks at these things, always gives an interesting twist to the issue. Next up after that is going to be uh, Dr. Maurice Glassman, or Lord Glassman, because he's been made a Labour life peer. But we don't take any notes of that, so it's just Morris to the rest of us. Um, right, um, he's uh, the Director of uh, Faith and Citizenship Programme at the London Metropolitan University. His research interests focus on the relationship between citizenship and faith, the limits of the market, the practice of community organising, the Jewish conception of community self-government, and most recently, he's been uh, in the dock himself, rather, because he's the inventor of Blue Labour, um, which has had... Um, Ex huge amounts of uh, media coverage. Uh, he defines Blue Labour as a small c conservative form of socialism that wants to return the Labour Party to its pre 1945 heyday. Last but not least, uh, John Sutherland, who's emeritus uh, Lord Northcliffe Professor of English Literature at University College London. He was twice on the Booker Prize Committee in 2005 as the chair. He writes regularly in the Times, the Telegraph, and the Guardian, and is a frequent broadcaster. He's the, one of the country's preeminent literary critics and highly uh, regarded in that. He's written many books, the latest of which is The Lives of the Novelists. Okay, no more ado. Clifford, kick us off, please. I have a slight <coughs> problem with the way the question is posed. Is individualism bad for society? Because it seems to me to propose a kind of tug of war between two ideas. Um, and a zero-sum game, so that if you pull too hard in one direction, you automatically reduce the other side. Um, and I, I think that that is possibly um, a, a narrow, a too narrow way of looking at some extremely complicated questions. May I just elaborate a little about where I come from? I've been a leader writer most of my life, Times, Telegraph, etc. before I became that at the tablet. Uh, my knowledge uh, of political philosophy is therefore that of a an interested amateur rather than a specialist, I don't have any qualifications in that field, nor in sociology, economics, or psychology. But the one area where I do have a little expertise is Catholic social teaching because I've had to work quite hard in producing some documents expounding that. The emphasis in Catholic social teaching, if you've not come across it before, is on the common good. 
and on organizing societies in such a way as to maximize the potential for integral human development of all. Now, it seems to me a better way of, of designing or, or understanding the, this question of individualism is to propose three principles rather than just the two, the collective and the individ solitary individual. And my three would be the state, society, and the individual. And I want to add the individual person because I wouldn't want to forget that we're talking about human beings and not just numbers. Each of those three principles seems to me to have the right and need for a certain degree of autonomy, but, but must never be allowed to claim ownership of the other two. In other words, though there can be pushing and pulling between those three principles, we get into very bad trouble when one of them becomes ascendant and predominant over the other two. I'll give you some examples of what I mean. I've just recently finished reading the great novel by Vasily Grossman, Life and Fate, uh, which seemed to me to be a collision between two versions of absolute political state power, both claiming ownership of the society and of the individual, to such a degree that individuals were totally disposable, and if the state decided to get rid of them, then it could. Society didn't exist in the sense that I'm using it in those, society, in, in those um, systems, they, because they were subject to the rule of one solitary political party. So we have total disposability of individuals under the situation where the state predominates over society and the individual. But the, the society must also be autonomous from state power. Um, the principle that I like here is the principle of subsidiarity, that power should be as pu pushed down to those who are affected by it as low as possible in the structure of decision making. Um, we could elaborate at length as to the, the weaknesses as well as the strengths of that idea, but I think it's a very important idea defining society and what society has to do. Subsidiarity does not mean that the state can take over society, but nor must society attempt to take over the state. And I think we can see many examples in the past of that happening mistakenly. Um, I think of the Catholic Church in Latin America in its very conservative days, attempted to dictate to the state how it should run society. We think of the attempt to, by conservative Islam to get states to impose Sharia law. And I think that is a, an attempt by one of my three principles to exert uh, ownership over the state in that case. And, by it, and with it comes, I think, ownership of individuals too. For me, what we need in societies is something strong but not overwhelming. And we need social capital and the common good. And, and on those circumstances, we expect to see a build-up of trust and society becomes healthier. We have seen, on the contrary, in recent years, it seems to me, a draining away so that society has become less healthy. But those, I don't think, are irreversible trends. And the third principle, of course, is the individual person. He needs, she needs, both the state and society, but must not try to take ownership of either, nor allow himself, herself, to be subject to either. So we, what I'm talking about re really here is the idea of three institutions, and uh, um, how we call it, dimensions, in a certain tension with each other, but neither of them, none of them predominating and overruling and taking ownership of the other two. And that seems to me, um, in my experience, that is a model which I find helpful and I deduce from Catholic social teaching, though you can deduce it from other uh, thought systems of ideas too. One, one thing that um, individuals need, of course, is protection so that they can pursue the pursuit of their maximum potential, and that is a very important role of the state. To, you, can, you cannot have freedom if you're terrified to go out at night, for example. There is, however, just add one more thing, a cuckoo in the nest, and that is the market. And the market is claiming ownership of all three of those uh, paradigms I've mentioned, of the state, of society, and on, on the individual. And we can see this happening in the United States. If you're in the United States and you have lost your job, you stand at very considerable risk of losing your housing and, losing, uh, and of becoming hungry. And I have a sister-in-law in precisely that situation, so I know how agonizing it can be. That seems to me a situation where the market has become supreme over the state, over society, and over the individual. And that is what we must not allow to happen to ourselves. Um, the predominance of the market over the state, I think we can see in the case of Greece, where Greece has lost its sovereignty to market forces. I think we should remember that markets are amoral, brainless, heartless, soulless institutions. Uh, they're not human in that sense. 
I also am concerned by talk of the big society because it seems to me that there is a potential there for the market to take over society because market forces are attractive ways to make a profit uh, and there are various entrepreneurs now moving into the field which ought to be occupied by civil society uh, in order to make a profit out of it. And we can see that happening in schools, we can see that in hospitals, and we're going to see it more and more in, in all forms of social care. Now, uh, I, can also, I also believe that markets, when un uncontrolled, work to undermine trust and social capital, both of which are essential to the development of a healthy society. And it seems to me that the real um, issue here it concerns at heart the principle of Adam Smith's economic theory in the wealth of nations that if we each pursue our own interests by an invisible hand, we achieve an effect which was not our intention, namely the welfare of society. In other words, what we all ought to do, according to this philosophy, is pursue our own interests. We ought not to have regard for society or the state, but only for our, what, it, what suits us. Or as he put it, it's not from the benevolence of the butcher, the brewer or the baker that we expect our daily food, but to, but to them of our necessities, but of the, our, our advantages. In other words, we each of us get up in the morning, make money, and go to bed. That is the role that the economic system that we have inherited, which I think goes, ought to go by the name of Homo economicus, um, is what is ruling us now, and I think is a major threat to individualism and to the stability and health of society. Thank you, Claire. I want to argue that, that individualism is, is not bad for society. In fact, it constitutes it. I'm not going to really get into the question of the state or the question of the market, mainly because I want to examine the relationship between the individual and society, and I would argue um, that society should be the determining factor um, in terms of the question of the state and in the question of the market. So for me, the question of the individual um, and society is prior um, to those questions. From Marx to Mill, from Kant to Sartre and beyond, there was once the universal idea that individuals were both the means and the end to the good or a better life. What do I mean by that? Is this the idea that a fuller life for individuals is the goal of society, of history, um, of development? And hand in hand with that is the understanding that the best way to get there, the best way to get to the goal of a better life, is through the fostering and the interaction of strong um, individuals. Now, this universal belief, completely intrinsic and to the Enlightenment liberal thinking, is no longer the case. I want to argue this is not because there's been a triumph of some kind of brutish individualism over collectivism. I think that's a myth. In fact, there has been an anti-individualist recasting of what it means to be human to form the basis for a new 21st century collectivism, which I think is more aptly called authoritarianism. But back for a moment to the universality of the individual um, as means and ends to the better society. In 1845, Karl Marx and Friedrich Engels published the German ideology, the foundational text of what came to be called Marxism. This might surprise people, but for Marx and Engels, the object of socialising production was, quote, the all-round development of the individual rather than the imp imposition of identity by force of circumstance or the social order. As they put it, the end of social progress, its goal, should be the freedom of an individual to determine his own destiny, to, quote, do one thing today and another tomorrow, to hunt in the morning, fish in the afternoon, rear cattle in the evening, criticise after dinner, just as I have a mind, without ever becoming hunter, fisherman, herdsman or critic. They also took for granted that people, quote, individuals that are developing in an all-round fashion, are the only means for social progress to the good life where society can become free manifestations of their lives. The view that the individual was the means and end of social development, not standing in opposition to it, was pretty much universal among liberal and enlightenment political philosophers. But over the last 166 years from when Marx and Engels wrote that book, during almost continuous assault from conservatives and anti-humanists, this view has been largely defeated and especially in the 21st centuries, individuals have been recast as vulnerable to harm. Today, we are largely regarded as creatures that are essentially driven or vulnerable to self-harm from our base instincts. Or, we are people who are vulnerable to harm or damage caused by the base instincts um, of others. 
The rise of this idea, we, we can develop this in some of the debate, is also linked to theories of individuality um, based around uh, consumption, because any theory that an individual is concerned, uh, uh, defined by consumption, obviously, uh, uh, tends to reduce people to a mouth to, to, to their kind of desires and instincts. If individuals are defined by their vulnerability, then they are also defined by their dependency on external institutions to impose civilised norms on them. John Stuart Mill in On Liberty, the greatest ever work of political philosophy, was alive to the danger of transforming the individual into a mass of vulnerable people so as to make them the object of external controls. It's an incredibly prescient work because even in 1859 he identifies lifestyle as the terrain on which a battle to transform individuals into the vulnerable is fought. He argued that for people to challenge vices and to have the virtues of the good life, then they needed to have the space for experiments in living, he called it, to work things out for themselves. Mill, in the Enlightenment tradition of Marx, regarded the individual as both the ends and means of social progress, seeing people as essentially virtuous, not vicious. His insight was that the question of the individual should be the question of what the individual should be, the end, what, what does it mean to be a fully rounded individual, how people should live, had not been settled. And that to impose external controls on how people should live damaged the means of arriving of a good life, the individual. As Mill noted, freedom requires the liberty of tastes, of pursuits, of framing the plan of our life subject to such consequences as may follow without impediment from our fellow creatures, even though they should think our conduct foolish, perverse or wrong. Each is the proper guardian of his own health, whether bodily or mental or spiritual. Moving away from a society based on assumptions of the responsibility or moral autonomy of people, that individuals are the means and end of social progress, has unleashed destructive um, tendencies. Today it is assumed we are all vulnerable. It is now taken for granted that the state needs to curb or nudge our tendencies to either give in to our base instincts or to damage others by them. I want to end with an example of the destruction that ensues when individuals are treated as vulnerable, as vicious rather than virtuous. Last month there was a case in Dundee where a family of six um, was broken up after social workers decided that four fat children could not be allowed to be brought up by their fat parents. The family, vulnerable because the parents were seen as vulnerable to their greed and their children to the harm of gluttony, obesity, the whole entire family was placed into care under the constant supervision of social workers to make them eat less and to exercise. To have a social worker stand and watch you eat is intolerable, said the father. He couldn't take the strain and left. The couple's three daughters, aged 11, 7 and 1, and five-year-old son, will now be fostered without contact or adopted. A family was broken up, a marriage of 20 years destroyed, they separated under the strain, because people were treated as vulnerable and not according to the true character of the individual, as Mill put it, to be the proper um, guardian, uh, guardian of his own health. To treat us as less than individuals, but as bundles of base instincts, is to reduce us to the status of apes, or subhumans, and naturally there is an extensive pseudoscience emerging to prove we are driven by basic behaviour or instincts. For those of us who believe in a free society, where the development of human beings can again be the means and ends of progress, I think there are two tasks. One is to impose the imposition of norms that see, seek to reduce us to vulnerable bundles of base desires. The other is to engage with other individuals in determined objectives to become more all rounded, to free us to rear families, new generations, to build communities. The individual needs once again to become both the ends and means to a better society. I'd like to say it's a pleasure to be here, but it's a, uh, you know, ambivalent. Um, <laughs> there's a troublemaker. Uh, yeah. Uh, and there's a reason why I accepted today and I refused previous invitations. I accepted today because. Bruno's my wife's cousin and it's his birthday and we thought we'd never see him unless I accepted. So happy birthday, Bruno. You should you should visit more often, as they say. I know you I know I know you're a very busy, fulfilled individual pursuing your own ends, but uh, sometimes you've got to think about your family. And um, the second um, ambivalence is the roots of, of the roots of the battle of ideas in Marxism and communism, which was obviously a very wicked ideology that oppressed individuals, that denied freedom of speech, that 
tortured people, shot people, killed people, and had a tendency, above all, to this individual collectivism thing. So the point I want to push is that what you always get with, with Marxist is a kind of hyper-liberalism, is a real love of the great, the great men, and they usually are men, you know, Marx, um, Engels, Trotsky, of course, um, Lenin, um, Mao, um, great intellectuals, you know, Ralph Luxemburg, yeah, Ralph Miliband, there you go. Uh, <laughs> Rosa Luxemburg is a, is a very good one. Um, and so, so what you have in Marxism is a weird hyperliberalism, which kind of hypo, you know, the, the glorification of the cult of the individual is not an accident in the theory. And then on the second, you've got a sort of collectivism. You've got a real, uh, so th there is an absolute connection between um, a, a robust, um, almost a, a, an unrelational individualism, which is based on the cult of genius on the one hand, and a collectivism that has no space for uh, tradition, for intermediate institutions, and above all, for local democracy. So what you do have in the straw man that I'm presenting is that Marxism has been it, relentlessly hostile to local practices, to local democracy, view, viewing that as reactionary, um, viewing that as getting in the way of development of an appropriate class consciousness. And it's no surprise to me that what you have in China today is the ultimate expression of fully developed Marxism, a totally oppressive state and a totally exploitative market in simultaneous motion all day long and every day. And that's why for Blue Labour, for example, we are unremitting in supporting democratic and free trade unions in China, and it's good to be remembered that trade unions in China are being shot, are being killed every day, and to express my solidarity always with those people. Um, just by, by way of anecdote, I always say that, and I was in the Lords, I was walking through the Lords lobby, and I was interrupted by the Chinese ambassador who told me, who told me that she agreed with all of this, and that's an interesting, um, interesting co-opting development. The main thing I want to say is that there really is no, I hate to say this, really no significant difference between what Clifford said and what I will say. I've, I'm very much inspired by a Catholic social thought. I think that the, in Catholic social thought, a distinction was made between capital and labor that is absolutely central to this discussion. And just to say that the Enlightenment tradition that Bruno mentions, um, you know, Marx, Mill, Sartre, Kant, is almost the list of, of the unrelational individualists um, that I was referring to, um, to earlier. And, and the idea, Bruno, that this is a kind of victimized, <laughs> victimized tradition, I think it is the public ideology of the public sector that you described. That the whole idea of protecting, in, protecting children from their own families, the whole idea that working class people basically get it wrong and need a police state, this is not to do with society, this is to do with the state. This is to do with the way that the state oppresses people. And it's once again, what is society? I think I, think I share Clifford's ambivalence. Only a philosopher, a, Marx, a Marxist, or an economist could, could phrase a question like, is individualism bad for society? It's, it's a kind of mad question when you think about it. It is clearly the case that, I mean, the idea of the personality is the way that Catholic social thought deals with it. They say, well, let's not talk about individuals. Let's talk about what it means to have a personality, a character. Now, the idea that people are naturally vicious or virtuous is part of the problem, I think, Bruno. You, le you, you learn to be virtuous and you learn to be vicious within, within the life that you have. And the key point that I would like to make is that we've got to break the collective individual dichotomy. We've got to look to society um, in, in terms of what it is. I think that I'd like to fill in the colour a little bit, say that in society there are things like, oh my God, families, that's part of society. I would like to say that there's faith institutions, that's another aspect um, of, of society. But the most important thing I'd like to talk about, and, and this relates to what Clifford just said, is that I would prefer to talk about the state, society, and the market as the three institutions that we've got to look at and being in balance and talk about the way that the market and the commodification of the person, the way that the person and the individual as the ultimate end is defined in terms of um, their, their consumer power and, their, and, and, their, and, and the very commodity commodification of their lives and, and their natural environment. And the only way that can be resisted is, is by um, a practice, a very difficult one, um, that I know is not beloved of, of, 
of the battle of ideas, which is democracy, which is the idea that people associate together, build trust with each other, build solidarity with each other to protect themselves from exploitation by the market and by oppression by the state. And that's going to take different forms. Now, that can, the paradox of the thing is that can only be done by strong individuals. Now, I've been involved for 15 years on living wage campaigns and community activism, and what I always say is you have no idea of the individual effort it takes to preserve or create any kind of sense of community in the prevailing culture which is dominated by capital. And it is the case since Athens. Now, obviously, Bruno, it cannot be the case that Mill's work is the greatest work in pl political philosophy. I do think that the British. sort of... Oh, fine, fine. Hmm. Look, I feel like I'm in the middle of a bloody family row here. Uh, Will you get on with it? You see, like, he doesn't show up for Christmas, so I have to save it up. <laughs> I have to save it this up is until a we issue, see Rick. each other. Come yeah. On. So I would, I would like, obviously, I would like, I would, I would probably think that After Virtue is a better book. But let's let's just go here and just say that Aristotle, who I think, you know, he's from Greece but, you know, we own them now, so uh, that's okay. Um, he made the distinction, not between the individual and the collective, he made the distinction that we are dependent beings, that we're dependent, obviously, the nature of our, of our birth is a dependency, the nature of how... We, we do not choose our parents, we do not choose our language, we do not choose a huge number of things. So the, I, the distinction is not between the individual, but between dependency and domination. And, and that's, a key, that's the key insight that structures, I think, Catholic social thought structures the sort of um, work that, that I do. And, and I think I'm coming to the end, is that right? So I'd just, I just like to talk about that idea of resisting domination. So I would argue that the only, idea, only way in which individuals um, can, can be, the idea of the individual can be strengthened is a relational one. Not the idea, as Marx put it, of the individual outside all relationships. You know, you do a bit of part-time work in the morning, you do a bit of chat in the afternoon. You know, you go fishing, and then you make a cabinet, and all these things. I'm not, I'm not a political cabinet, a wooden sort of cabinet. Um, <laughs> that sort of thing is to completely ignore the idea of vocation and the way that vocation has preserved knowledge and skills from the force of commodification of the market, mm -hmm. the way that that links to a sense of virtue, of an excellence in individual um, attainment, but that individual <coughs> attainment, paradoxically, can only take place if there's an ethical and knowledge-based culture that can enforce that, and then the idea of value, that you create excellence and value through that, and that's based on the idea that the fundamental trilogy, as opposed to liberty, equality, and fraternity of the Enlightenment, I would say relationships, the importance of relationships, that those should be reciprocal, reciprocity, and that they should have responsibility within them. So vocation, virtue, value, res relationships, reciprocity, responsibility, and all of that is to resist two things. To resist the domination by the rich, which can never be done on an individualistic basis, can only be done on a democratic basis, and to resist also the domination of the state, which wishes to instrumentalise all relationships, and you end up with fat kids being oppressed by quite fat social workers. And for those of you who didn't understand what was going on, because, I, because quite a lot of people here don't uh, uh, follow the things as closely as you, Morris, and because I was the publisher of um, uh, LM Magazine, which was Living Marxism, this is kind of an old spat. On the latter point that you made, all of those points are very important, and we will come back to things like relationships, family, and the market, which is the point that Clifford also alluded to. I think they're key things for us to explore. But John, outside of the family, what do you reckon? Um, in her very friendly introduction, Claire properly identified me as a literary critic, and I'll keep my comments for what they are within that framework. Now, um, it's normal at the Battle of Ideas to start with a very provocative question by way of title, is individualism bad for society? I'd like to rephrase that. Is literature bad for society? <laughs> now, that I think would be seen as nonsensical because literature is quintessentially individualistic. Indeed, the law of co copyright is framed on that principle, that the fruits of my mind, when they're articulated in literature, become my property and my inalienable property for however long uh, the, the duration of copyright is, 70 years in this country at the moment. So, yeah, literature is individualism. Now, let me rephrase the question a different way. Is literature bad for society? And I think, I'm not leading towards a false syllogism, by the way, but I think most people would say, no, literature is very good for society. 
Now, I, I'm at the, I'm well over the, um, the borderline into retirement. And I had a full career of 40 years. And what did I do during those 40 years? I read novels. Um, as Wittgenstein said on his deathbed, I believe they were his last words, it was fun. But was it anything more than fun? Well, I would argue it is. Now, um, the novel uh, is the only major literary form whose beginning, whose genesis, whose <laughs> origin, arrival, whatever you call it, uh, we can put a, a fairly precise date to. It happened in the, the early 18th century, possibly a little bit earlier. That coincides with something else, namely economic individualism, mercantilism, you know, the, the early, the, the, the foundations of what we see as, as the modern capitalist state or organization, society. Now, those two can be, in fact, critics have, Ian Watt famously, they can be correlated. Let's say capitalism and the rise of the novel, the rise of the, these two things, do seem to be some, somehow intertwined. George Eliot in Middlemarch says very, very eloquently, very movingly, that what the novel does is it defines individual boundaries. That's to say, it, it gives us, as it were, a way of relating sympathetically with somebody else and to appreciating that they have what she calls an equivalent centre of self. That they are as individually important to themselves as we are to ourselves. In fact, society is made up of these. The early novel, in fact, early novel, early fiction, uh, Robinson Crusoe, Pamela, uh, Fanny Hill even, what they did was to take people who were generally regarded as fairly unimportant, you know, bad sons who ran away to sea, servant girls, prostitutes, and to say that as individuals they're very important. They had an equivalent centre of self that you know, we could actually sympathetically in a kind of way sort of uh, uh, interact with them. Now this relates to, to, to another point, it seems to me, that we are surrounded, we have a, a gargantuan appetite for fiction. I mean, tonight I have to, I'm leaving and I have to make my mind up whether I'm going to see the Ides of March or we must talk about Kevin. Uh, last night I watched Wallanda on BBC4, rather, rather dull pre prehistoric Swedish version of Volander, I thought. Um, you know, I, 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 I read various stories in, in the newspapers. I'm surrounded by fiction, and I think most of us are. We, we, you go to the West End cinema, you, you find it rather hard to find you know, documentary realistic uh, uh, films uh, uh, to go to. And our television programs, the networks, are, are, are largely... Free. We, we, are, we, we actually sort of uh, live uh, in these imaginary worlds, things that never happen. Now, why is that? And it would seem to me that it's a way of actually, to some extent, you know, coming to terms with, that, with that, that, that kind of nature of our individual existence. That's to say, if I go tonight and sort of see sort of, um, you know, sort of uh, George Clooney in, in the eyes of March, something that the characters he's playing never existed, and yet somehow I will be inside those characters, I will appreciate them. I, I will have a sense, a kind of, it, will, it, will, it will develop um, that sympathetic uh, Connection, which I think um, you, know, it, you could call a kind of high form of individual. We're, very, we, we're educated, a sentimental education, as, as another novelist put it. Now, it seems to me that historically we're at a very interesting point in the development of fiction, of literature, and of the novel. Walter Benjamin, uh, in one of his many paradoxes, he liked to throw little hand grenades into, in, into one's brain, said that it would be very interesting to have newspapers in which the front page was the letters page. It'd be a bit like having the Today programme kick off with thought for the day. Well, if they think religion's important, why don't they? <laughs> and why don't they put the kind of things which Bruno reports on from Brussels and, you know, at the end, where the sport should be and so on. But they don't do that, because in fact there's a kind of hierarchical sense of importance. But, but it seems to me fiction is now at a very interesting point. If you go to, if you, if you, uh, go to uh, switch on your computer and Google fanfic, you'll find there's a huge amount of fiction out there which is being written individualistically. What's happening is, is that the readers have taken over the production of novels because novels are created by authors, which has a, obviously a kind of linguistic connection with authority, just as films are the work of directors, which you connect with dictatorship. And what's happening is we are seeing a dem democratization, which is individuals and run mad. Now, it so happens that most of that, that fanfic out there on, on the net, you know, sort of spin-offs from Harry Potter or 
or Lord of the Rings are two really big sort of fanfic industries. Most of it's pretty crap, but a lot of it is extremely good. There's much more talent, uh, it seems to me, in the reading community than there is, given, than we often give it credit for. Very interesting things are happening with the reading of fiction at the moment. What's happening is, is, is the evolution of readers' groups. It's happened the last 30 years. The last thing readers' groups want, and I, I speak from personal experience, is professors coming in and, and telling you know, people what these texts mean. If you go to a readers' group, you have to go into incognito. The, the other thing is, as I say, sort of fanfic. Uh, the third thing is the, the growth of the, of, 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 of the festival, literary festival. Very interesting phenomenon. Um, I, I've, I've been told to shut up, um, <laughs> which I will do. But it seems to me, I, I, I wish I could live for another 50 years, mm. which I won't, in order to know what is going to happen to that literary form to which I've devoted the last 50 years. I'll finish there. Thank you. Clifford, I, I wanted to, uh, just turning to you, I, I suppose the, the thing that I wasn't sure about what you said, which I think, whilst Morris agreed with you, or maybe you could both look at this one, um, because one of the things in terms of contemporary uh, social policy, which is one of the, my concerns, has been the erosion of this notion of the individual and individual autonomy. In, in, that's what I wanted to ask you about. So, you know, the nanny state, the nudge state, that side of things, rather than the the protective point that you'd made. You know, this idea that kind of like we shouldn't be allowed to make our own minds up. Um, how do you view well, that or how does my, that My response in? is to say that, that I'm in favour, as I think you are, Claire, and your question implies that the maximisation of personal autonomy, recognising, however, that you quickly run into limits. In other words, you cannot maximise forever or unlimitedly. You're going to find that you're running into the problem that other people have autonomy and you're imprinting on their autonomy. But I would be, my, 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 I think, with a small L, I'd come down on a liberal side of the sort of argument we heard, particularly the case of the social worker. I wouldn't want my family being interfered with by social workers of that kind, and I think I should tell the, the state to piss off if ever it happened to me. Mm -hmm. So I don't really have a quarrel with that kind of individualism. But if, you, but if the word individualism means an ideology where the individual is supreme, then I become much more cautious. Yeah, I, I mean, just, just on... Um, uh, uh, maybe Morris you can pick this up or either of you um, when the big society was announced I actually liked it quite a lot um, got into quite a lot of trouble for saying that um, uh, with people who thought this was a terrible thing to say but the reason, I, the, the reason I liked it was because um, at least rhetorically it was saying you know individuals and small I mean the point that you yeah. actually made uh, it was like civil society but you know that phrase is enough to kill you off in a way but you know in the sense of community groups and if you if the state got out of the way we would all help each other and our neighbours and so on and so forth when they obviously it's kind of gone a bit different now and it might end up leading to the marketization of services and so on as Clifford implied <coughs> but did you feel the same about that because actually yeah. London Citizen yeah. was a little bit inspiring of it even well not even but you know what I mean yeah. No, no, I mean, um, so, so first of all, the, the, the whole idea of, of New Labour, that it was too statist and too market-based, I, I completely agreed with. But what you see is the limits of liberal conservatism is that they can't confront market power. So reasonable critique of the state, but no, no critique of the market, and you can see that in lots of ways. I just want to pick you up on, on one thing, which is I think you're sharing with, with Bruno, is that you're seeing... The whole public policy debate is all centred on the autonomy. So right. the whole public policy debate is centred on the individual. It's completely unrelational and it's all about that. I would call, I have before almost called it a Maoist Rousseau-esque conception. And the idea is individual care packages. The idea is, is that families that don't conform to public sector morality, that don't accept the um, Marx, Mill, Sartre, Kant canon, um, should, should basically be separated from their, from their parents. The idea that it's, it's bad to be with, with parents who didn't go to university, who may be religious, these are all... Th so the threats to the child from the parents were very, very explicitly understood and formed under that form of welfare. So, so, so what you have is you have the absolute domination of market state models... But what these families are, 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 are they lacking in any support and relationships? Where's the co-op movement? Where's the burial society? Where's the self-help? Where's the culture of labour that used to support working class people against that form of domination? So this is the point I'm making to you, is we've got to think, the reason the big society was an interesting idea, I think, for you, 
and for me was a oh good it's going to be a time that people could come together and do things together there's going to be a redistribution of power to, to local people and communities and that hasn't that hasn't happened at all in the welfare it hasn't happened at all in the political constitution but don't don't imagine there is this is the point i'm making i guess there's an absolute connection between um collectivism and this individualism and it erodes both it, it completely in the name of the good in the name of liberating children from um oppressive parents you end up with the dundee um, fat child situation bruno i wanted to to ask you actually um in relation to the riots when i said at the beginning people had blamed the me 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 society mm. i mean i myself was uh, and have written about and I'm concerned about a kind of narcissism um, that has afflicted contemporary uh, young, young generations. Um, or, you know, a, a, they've been over flattery of the youth, of young people, a sense of entitlement that sometimes can actually feel like a me, me, me society. Mm -hmm. And then also some of the, 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 the most galling things about the, uh, about the riots was indeed that these, uh, that people actually trash their own communities or communities they lived in. And you did think, you know, I live in Wood Green and I did think, what are you doing? Do you know what I mean? I mean, it's like, not, it's pretty trashy at the best of times. You don't need it <laughs> trashing further. Um, but, you know, it, it, and, and it was like, well, what, why, why would I care about you? You're just neighbours or, you know what I mean? I mean, it was a, I was nervous. And so then you think, I could do with a bit less me, me, me and a bit more us, us, us. Mm -hmm. So uh, does that conflict with what you're arguing, or how do you feel about that? I mean, I have a lot of problems with those rioters. I have a lot of problems with the sense of entitlement, the, the kind of me, me, me um, society. Being a, a strong individual or a, a developed individual doesn't mean you're me, me, me. In fact, the, the idea of me, me, me is encouraged by this idea of vulnerability, this idea that we are driven by our instincts, that um, consumption is both our high point um, and our low point and our only relation um, to others is what we're told to do um, by various um, external authorities. Mill, when he talked about the need, um, and Mill certainly wasn't an ideologue, the whole, the whole raison d'etre of his argument that people be given space for experiments uh, in living was because of ideology, because of the dominant, a dominant ideology of the time utilitarianism. Um, so Mill makes this argument not because we can, we're just indulgent with whatever anybody wants to do, but this space we have for experiments um, in living is where we can acquire the virtue of judgment ourselves. And Mill, in, on liberty, is certainly not you know, unjudgmental about certain forms of activity. I mean, he was horrified by the idea of a divorce, for example. He just didn't think um, that the state, via the ideology of utilitarianism, should tell people not to divorce. And he thought that would actually be bad for people. But if you started telling people they couldn't divorce people's per personal relationships, would actually get worse. So I would argue that actually this redefinition of individuals around the idea of vulnerability, and I suspect that actually Morris and Clifford would agree with me a lot on some of this, is actually quite destructive. It does unleash some destructive forces, just as it kind of invites the state in to dominate and destroy families. It also encourages people. I mean, if you bring up, yeah, if you bring up young people and say, you know, you are just driven by your instincts, you do actually also foster a bit of a cult of a base instinct that, to, that pleasure, desire, is all that makes us human. The flip side of that is to be regulated because um, it's also you know, the, the, the cult of desire, um, gratification, um, and all the rest of it um, is also seen as damaging um, to other people. John, one of the things that I wasn't sure about what you were saying in terms of the people writing a lot more on the web and so on and so forth. I'm a little nervous about the idea that um, self-expression is always a good thing, by which I mean there are times when I think that there are people who are able to express themselves better than others, just in terms of the judgment point. Because the democratisation point you referred to can mean that people feel entitled to say, well, you know, how can you say that novel's better than my novel? Or, you know, we, we're all, let, let everybody have a, a voice. And is there not... A, a, a potentially over self-flattery there and that sometimes you one has to want to suppress one's desire to you know gratify your own voice being heard in the public arena until you've got something worth saying or reading if you see what I mean a, a lot of education is based on that on that premise um, it's been buggered up in my view by the fact that if you make 
you know, undergraduates, for instance, pay a small fortune for their education, they're going to actually sort of tell you what they want to read. So, in fact, those old structures of, you know, read it because it's good for you are, are gradually eroding in universities now because, in fact, we've customerized, we've turned into customers rather than students, um, you know, the, 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 the uh, undergraduate body. On the question about, um, you know, whether or not it, it just creates kind of false sense of, of, of value, it seems to me a lot of fanfic is based on homage. That's to say, it starts from an admiration and a desire to emulate and a desire to get inside certain texts, which again is, is all literature is there. I mean, the whole anxiety of literature, anxiety of influence argument depends on that. You know, that, that Keats obviously was was strongly influenced by Spencer yeah. and wrote a very Spencerian kind of poetry, but that wasn't, in a sense, to you know, to, to overset Spencer. It was an, a really an attempt actually to really create a, a much more you know, organic and vital relationship with the past. So it seems to me you can argue that in fanfic. What it seems to me to go wrong is in newspapers now, that's to say, if you read comment as free in The Guardian, oh, it is sickening. It yeah, is yeah. absolutely bloody Completely sickening. Completely sickening. Mm. Um, yeah, yeah. You know, this sort of... Uh, consensus is broken out on the panel. Yeah, uh, yeah. Well, no, I mean, sort of, it, 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 it's horrible. I mean, it the, thing, the things that, you know, <laughs> uh, just, to, just to keep to my own subject, when, you know, sort of, uh, Sam Jordison set up a little thing saying, what, what, who's the most overrated, what's the most overrated work of literature in, in history? And, and he thought everyone was going to say things like Don Quixote or whatever. In fact, they all went for Ian McEwan. And the thing, you know, the foul-mouthed invective which was dumped on that really excellent novelist, not because, in fact, people, you know, disagree, disagree with the kind of, you know, uh, qualities which are sometimes ascribed to him, but just simple, malevolent vituperation. It was, it's, it's sickening. And, and every day in the Electronic Guardian, which I think is, a, you know, probably the best newspaper we have, it, you know, that that, 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 that I find very, very worrying. I'm interested by this idea of narcissism um, that Claire mentioned and then the kind of comments um, that just followed from John in terms of the comment is three pages on The Guardian. Um, and one of the things I've been wondering recently a lot is whether or not there has become a sort of narcissistic individualism where it's all about me and my ideas and what I think and everyone's got to respect that. And I think it might tie into a sort of relativistic approach to truth, actually, you know, whatever I say goes, and because I say it, that's enough for it to go and be respected by everybody kind of out in the world. And I just wonder what the panel would have to say about that. I just had a question, which is sort of, where have all the individuals gone? Uh, because I think there are fewer and fewer of them around today, sort of paradoxically. They may be uh, leaving for the West on uh, boats, uh, but the kind of fully rounded uh, individual who was all the sort of different things that was remarkable uh, in himself, right, had created a unique personality, fully rounded, and maybe he was a critic in the evening and a hunter in the morning or whatever you like, but was a unique personality, sometimes um, called eccentric as a result. It just seems to me that there are fewer of them around. There are lots of um, people who fit into certain packages, you know, student, merchant banker, housewife, uh, gay man, etc. So there are identities around. You could probably count them. My father has a theory there's about 19 of them, and you can slot everybody uh, in the world into, into one or the other. But are there not fewer uh, well-rounded individuals who have developed themselves and made the most of their life, and you would have the experience of meeting them and say, uh, you're a bit odd? Uh, and, and different. And so where, where, where are they going? Is that simply uh, a crushing uh, power of commodification that we're somehow unable to resist and that we're shoehorned into those boxes despite our will? Or are there other forces in society that may be uh, hostile to the idea of not conforming uh, and that it's increasingly maybe more relatively more difficult uh, for people not to uh, conform, that there's less uh, cultural and social validation around the idea of making your own way in the world uh, uh, and following your own path wherever that might lead you just to say I'm worried about the <clears throat> Morris your point to say follow your vocation get in the box rather than follow a, a free choice to develop your personality in a unique way 
I see individualism as being really pernicious because it internalizes external constraints on people. So there, your achievement in your life is at least on a, like in a superficial statistical sense very strongly determined by where you were born and other such factors. Um, mainly where you were born, actually. Um, and I see. Whereas in individualism, you can see this if you say interview a banker and you ask them, "Why are you? Why do you have all the money when everybody else doesn't?" And they say, "Because I'm clever, and like I, as an individual, am superior to them. That is why I have been re rewarded for it." And it kind of leads to us not addressing these lo these these wider social social problems. I think. The way that I see individualism is selfishness has to play a part in that because obviously if you're looking out for your own interests, you stop looking out for others. And just whether that is individualism, and if it is, should we really be encouraging people to not think about society and how can you have a society if everyone is selfish, fundamentally? Yeah. Core questions, it seems, uh, embodied in that question. Is there a clash between self-interest and the interests of others. That's the way it's posed. I don't know that there is, but that's what we ought to look at. And it is seen that over-individualism will mean that you're selfish and neglect others, and that's, that's a territory we're interested in. OK, uh, Morris, any thoughts on anything? I, I just begin with a sort of quote from the, from the Pope about in self-interest and, and particularly free market economics. He said, well, since Adam Smith, we've really tried to be bad and pursued the bad in the hope that it would be good. It was in the latest analysis of the fiscal crisis. He said, well, how about now if we actually try being good? It may not be such a bad idea. Now, I know usually people laugh at that sort of thing, so it's a sign of where we've got to that people actually listen. Um, and, and so one of the problems we've got, and this goes back to Bruno's issue with the fat family, is that it's seen as wrong to have interests. But in, in a society which is dominated by rich and I see it as dominated by rich people and by educated people, and particularly by educated people with law, economics, and sociology degrees. <laughs> and what, what's got to happen, so just to answer the question at the back, I find really fantastically well rounded individuals that I found in London citizens. For example, someone who'd be a hospital cleaner, a priest, in a, uh, a lay preacher in a church, a mother, and, and take care of her mother. People did incredible things, but we define an individual in terms of some celebrity idea of being an eccentric. Being an individual is not being an... It, to be a fulfilled individual doesn't mean you have to break your mother's heart. It really is not necessary for the job. And I think... So what we've got is a celebrity eccentric, and this is the hypostatized version of the mill position, but the, that what I'm saying is that's what it can... The harm to others, the whole issue of the harm to others leads on the one side to the social workers being involved and on the other side it leads to a definition of what being a fulfilled individual is in terms of how many dissident kind of experiences you've, you've stacked up. I just want to get back to, to quick, the quick, novel, yeah. the novel, I'm just really yeah. interested in this. If we think of the greatest ever work of fiction, um, it was a collective work and it was called The Bible. And um, it was written by many, many hands. And a lot of the great <laughs> films were written by many hands. Why have we got to a situation? So I think, I think there's going to be a return to associative writing, of people getting together, writing things together. And I think that's going to be fantastic, both in fiction and philosophy and politics. OK, thanks. John, any thoughts on anything? No, I agree with what just been said. Um, I spent a long time of my career um, in a division of humanities and social sciences, which really was a kind of mismatch in some ways. But mm -hmm. The, um, the social scientists were, were wedded to what they call rational choice theory, yeah, yeah, yeah. which meant that if you, you know, if you, if you were an ethnic minority living in a ghetto and you had a rational choice between making a lot of money selling drugs or making very little money selling, not selling, serving hamburgers, you would actually rationally choose the one over the other, and that you should bear that in mind. And the other day on the Today program, um, John Humphreys hauled up for inspection, really for a kind of sort of. Um, muted contempt, someone who was getting 1400, 1600 a month on benefits um, and he was asked why he didn't you know, take a minimum wage job and said that it, you know, it, would, just be a, it would just be handy pandy, it would, it would mean no extra money and he wouldn't see his children. That was a rational choice. It seems to me that sometimes the social scientists get it right, but I can't quite see how I handle it, because you know, was rioting a rational choice? I don't know. <coughs> okay, thanks. And um, Bruno? Um, 
I think there is a problem of narcissism, and, and one of the problems of narcissism is extremely um, one-sided uh, and limited, and tends to give rise to this very a very shallow um, form of egotism, a very shallow form um, of um, selfishness, because the, the, the concept of selfishness um, is, is quite a broad um, and deep one um, as well. And I guess you know the, the, one of the aspects of being a more fully rounded um, individual, of developing as an individual, um, which, which is of course what I was talking about and why the mill idea is so um, important, is that in a way brings you into the discipline of making judgments. It brings you into the discipline of forming relationships with people, of engaging with other people to raise families, to um, build communities, and through that um, development of being an individual to also um, form um, interests as well. And as well, Morris, as Morris has well observed, and through most of us, through the experience of the world of work and the work of politics, you can sometimes see that happening to people. You can see the journey of somebody becoming a more fully rounded um, individual through that um, mm -hmm. engagement. Now, the importance of the idea that individuals need to develop, which goes all the way back, um, as I was saying, and also to Mill, is actually we don't agree, and I don't think any of us here on the panel would agree with the idea that the development of individuals has reached a high point. We can go no further. There are some good individuals that can tell us how to be an individual, and we've arrived. And that's the whole point of Mill. The whole point of Mill is saying we needed this space. We needed this experiments in living. We needed to make judgments ourselves. We needed to develop more was because we're not there yet. There is the truth. There is right and wrong. There are some ideas are better than other ideas. But we haven't settled um, that question for all um, history um, and all the turn in. That is why um, the individual and the development of the individual um, is um, so important. And I, and I just want to emphasise no, no, no. that, that the, the question of society arises out of the relationships that exist between um, individuals in the pursuit of their development, the pursuit um, of interest. And it is society which should subordinate the economy and the state to its interests and not the other way around. There's a massive confusion about the meaning of the word autonomy. On one side, autonomy means, in, in particularly in Kant, outside of all relationships and self-determining uh, through the, the assertion of your sovereign will, that's the supremely individualist position. And then there's autonomy in a sort of the Camp David sense, which is a negotiated settlement around existing powers. Now, obviously, I would say that the, the really important one is, is the autonomous individual in the second sense, that we are constituted by power and inheritance and to preserve the space with which we can, can find meaningful relationships which are individually asserted self-world, rather than imagine the end to be an individual outside of all power and relationships, which I think haunts the Romantic and Enlightenment imagination. <clears throat> um, I'd like to uh, try to start by di directly trying to answer the question that the, the lady in the hat, as you called her, asked you about selfishness and self-interest. Um, I struggled for a long time to get my head round the idea of the common good. And eventually, when I had that aha moment, I thought I saw what they were talking about. <coughs> I realised it resolves this question of the conflict between selfishness and unselfishness because we all have an interest in living in a better society. We all want to see things improve, because it improves our lives too when they improve, and your lives improve, my life improves, etc. We'll all look out for each other. Is it, this, it, may, it may not be selfish, it may be, you may want to call it enlightened self-interest, it's not. It's a contribution to the common good, which I think solves the problem of the conflict between selfishness and unselfishness, because we are actually trying to improve our own circumstances as well as trying to improve everybody else's circumstances at the same time. Now, I usually find myself at this point talking about virtue. Virtue mm -hmm. needs to come back onto the scene as a primary issue to discuss in this day. The virtues of prudence and courage, for example, are absolutely essential to some of the things we've been talking about. Um, and I'm a great fan of uh, Alastair McIntyre and his great work, After Virtue, which revived the concept of virtue. Um, it goes back, I think, to Wittgenstein, um, uh, its, it's reappearance. But these are ideas we re really do very badly need to rediscover. And I think, as a matter of fact, just to conclude, point about literature, a lot of literature is actually exploring personal relationships, interrelationable issues, in terms of, implicitly at least, virtue versus vice. And I think, actually, literature can do a tremendous, tremendous job, a kind of moral education, if you like, by seeing through the process where 
and whereby people pursue personal development and seek virtue. It seems to me that the debate is at cross-purposes, in actual fact. You all seem to actually agree that individualism is a good thing. However, one side sees isolationism as a bad thing, and the other, particularly Bruno, seems to see isolationism as being perfectly fine. And this kind of ties in, like, you all seem to agree that the individual ought to be autonomous of the state and to some extent of society. However, I mean, this is kind of where the selfishness and the self-interest issue comes in as well. Isolationism means selfishness, but individualism means self-interest. Like, I, I, I kind of thought that um, Clifford misquoted Adam Smith or misunderstood Adam Smith when he said that it's the self-interest of people that leads to common good through freedom of, of, of exchange, of ideas, of capital, of labour, um, rather than the other way around. I think we need to make a distinction between individualism uh, which is always uh, narcissistic. Individualism, the ism aspect, invariably leads to individual solutions in a very narrow sense, and even with best intention, always has a nar narcissistic consequence. And the individual and the cultivation of individual potential, which can be realized through a number of different strategies, not necessarily through individualism. And I think that once we begin to see the problem in, in that kind of a way, making a conceptual distinction between individual individualism and individuation, which has also been raised, those three things, that we can begin to you know, sort of explore the problem uh, in a more uh, sort of nuanced way. My main concern is that today we haven't got a story, we haven't got a, the cultural support for the individual. And the only way that, even in fiction, that we can talk about the individual in a very, it's in a very mean-spirited, you know, sort of problematic kind of a way. And it's interesting that if you look at films or literature, it's very difficult to find somebody who you could feel really sympathetic to. I often go to see a film, and I go away, and, and I kind of sense a lack of empathy between me and the characters, because all the individuals are not just flawed, but they're deeply flawed. They have real, uh, a, a real kind of minimal sense of who they really are about. And I think that what we need to be concerned about is why is it that we become so confused about giving any meaning to the individual in anything other than in a, in a kind of very banal, everyday, limited kind of sense. And I think once we begin to confront that problem, then the relationship between individual and the, and the wider question of solidarity, the wider relations, do begin to fall into place. And uh, in many respects, the problem that we're looking at is ultimately a cultural one. It's, it's a cultural problem that we're confronted with, where we've lost belief in, in the individual and therefore seek refuge in a very caricatured version of that, which is often nothing other than a narcissistic, individualized kind of representation. I would have thought the big problem with individualism in our society is all the individuals who want to live in a gated community and who don't want to participate at all or the ones who have actually opted out and you, you know there's a local problem and they don't want to come to a public meeting and have anything to do with it, they'd rather watch television. I mean, they're, they're, that's the real problem. I mean, Morris talks about well, community action, all those people who are going to go and, out there and G up the community. Um, it's hard work. It is. <laughs> and unless people perceive a threat or a promise, you won't get very many out yeah. there. Uh, and they won't stay for very long, except, of course, for nice people here, who probably will, but that's not the people you really want to activate, is it? I think, I think though, I just, just in response to that, one bit of nervousness I've got is, uh, we were talking about the big society, is, is that we also, we have to, I think, be a little bit careful, because of some of these things of, of developing uh, or trying to avoid being contemptuous of our fellow citizens. I mean, actually sitting on the couch watching the telly is not the worst thing in the world. You know, you're not abusing anyone and you should be free to do it. You don't have, it's not, in other words, you can't make activism compulsory. You can might okay. want to inspire people to do it. But this is, I think, what, what's, a, what's at stake here is that if you think, okay, just, just go, to the, the opposition is, 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 if you're isolated, you're powerless. That's the key. That's the whole argument that I'm making here. If you don't have relationships with other people who will stick up for you when you're attacked, yeah you get screwed. And so the relationships are fundamental. This is the thing. And we are dependent beings. And, and we depend on a lot of things. Just, just to develop that thing with the interests. 
what we Very say quick, in community Mike. organizing to people it's around living wage it's around affordable housing it's around safer streets it's around stuff that is in people's interest so the common good is not just the common good is somewhere you get to when you've had these conversations but it's, the common good has got to include the interests of the poor and the excluded obviously solutions like skydiving and tattooing and uh, hedonistic sex and drinking is not a solution to be more individualistic but the idea of kind of uh, what we think about certain issues like responsibility giving a lead we see things like occupy wall street not having any leadership people promoting the idea that they're leaderless giving a lead taking a stand getting people to commit to certain things in the public sphere is a way of beginning to recast the idea of an individual in relationship to the collective I just wanted to turn a little bit to, to education, actually, because it seems to me that, um, cliched as it might be, the idea of the teacher is someone who, who inspires, who is the individual who can inspire individuals, seems to have been lost in education. And I think that the drive over the last 15 years, 20 years probably, is towards a teaching profession that is utterly compliant and conformist. And so, you know, that individual who is a bit wacky, a bit odd, actually inspired young people with knowledge is, is, is largely gone. And that's clearly a, a wider issue about, um, about education, problems in education, but I think is one that really needs to be addressing because where are there for the, in, you know, where, if these teachers are not there anymore, what's happening to our young people? Because compliance and conformity seems to be the order of the day. Individual is working, say, for the, the collective good or the society at large, say we could arguably substitute for the state if it's the whole um, country, would they necessarily be as motivated um, to work as hard? As you see in communist com countries, output is never as high and living standards aren't as high as they tend to be in capitalist countries in the first world. And if output is not as high and living standards aren't that high and society is not producing as much as they were beforehand due to different motives, is that society not worse as people are worse off in that society? Um, I just wanted to talk a bit about narcissism and um, actually if it's kind of undermining the notion of individualism because as far as I can see quite a lot of the sort of me, me, me culture or the undermining of expertise um, because people need to have their own voice is actually kind of something that's imposed by the corporate culture because they're just trying to encourage this construct of individualist consumer and in fact it's not individual at all it's just seeing each individual as comprising one consumerist mass which is driven by, uh, which, well, which is needed to forward the prof profit motive. We have increasingly been told, and we've had a lot of people actually on panels at this festival arguing this, that, you know, as humanity, uh, now that we have greater insights into humanity through the developments in neuroscience and uh, uh, um, uh, genetics, that actually um, this explains our actions. And in, that is obviously the reduction of people and the, uh, at an assault on, or a more fatal, uh, an assault on the sort of idea of how much freedom as an individual you have. And even some of the sort of anti-corporate stuff gets dangerously close to that. I mean, this idea that you, and in fact it just got raised in another session earlier, that's why I'm raising it, that, that, you know, the corporate world are all brainwashing us. Also, there is a kind of bit about, we well, you know, not necessarily. Um, I, you know, I am capable of, of kind of like having the messages given to me by the corporate world and thinking they're talking rubbish. I mean, it, or, you know, because that's some of the thing is, is that, oh, well, the problem is, is that we're so susceptible to the messages and so on and so forth. So I'm just slightly nervous that we don't just turn it into um, this social policy thing, but know that there are a number of trends that make an assault on individual autonomy a real um, issue that's not just uh, to do with policy, but intellectual trends as well. Yeah, it's just a thought. Has globalisation, the fact that we've suddenly realised we're so small as individuals, made us become a lot more insular and stay in our homes and just watch TV? The way people describe Adam Smith is usually that there is some kind of 18th century version of Margaret Thatcher. And usually they haven't read Adam Smith, and usually they use the same quote that Clifford Longley used without kind of thinking about the context at all. If you actually read Adam Smith, you'll see he's very much a figure of the Enlightenment, of the Scottish Enlightenment. And what he's doing is, first of all, saying that we will, pursue, we will progress 
as humanity through pursuing our interests, it's not just a question of altruism, it's about pursuing our interests. We will, pursue, we will progress by being rational. We benefit from economic growth. Uh, we should aspire to progress and have a better kind of society. And that is something that is very, very positive, not something to be caricatured as some kind of crass Thatcherism. Um, from what I uh, someone said about individualism um, be, meaning uh, self-interest, um, with that in mind, and I would say that individualism is a good thing for society, and based on what I sort of understand about John Locke, and that basically he said an individual only consents or only enters a society for protection of um, themselves and their property. And so with that in mind, if a person is, is a part of society and is working for the better of themselves, then surely they'll, they'll try and improve the society for the common good so that they themselves will have a better life and will enjoy being in society and enjoy living better more than being by themselves. The Occupy Wall Street protest, certainly in terms of the Occupy Victoria Square protest in Birmingham, which are a real, very depressing when you look at the Facebook page, you can see that what's that the refusal to have leaders, which I think has come out of the feminist movement, and I remember when I was a feminist, I was 15 a million years ago, we had consciousness raising sessions, and you didn't, you refused to have leaders because you, you know, there was a bad thing to do, and you were just trying to share your consciousness and, and raise your consciousness through discussing things. When you apply that to a situation where you're actually trying to not just con raise consciousness, but to actually take control of mm. something, then it, it just does not work. And what you can see if you look at the Facebook page of um, the Occupy What's It protest is that their refusal to have a debate and their refusal to have some kind of mechanism to stop the person with the biggest mouth and the most interfering mind and the most free time to take control means that they're, they, they, they are just falling apart. They're, they're, they get themselves all into these terrible discussions about, about idiotic things that, that are irrelevant Absolutely. and they haven't got a mechanism to tell people to shut up because they're missing the, the main point. And it's, it's a thing about the, the need for strong individuals and a mechanism to enable the strong individuals to come to the fore. Uh, so, John, your final thoughts, please. I don't know if individualism is a bad thing. It would be a very interesting discussion, by the way. But I'm certain that atomism is. And I do regret the smashing of the unions, uh, the loss of you know, solidarities, which used, in fact, to weld people together. And also the, the loss of class identity in many yep. ways. It seems to me that a society which is atomized is not freer, it's more, more liable to be tyrannized over. Mm -hmm. uh, thank you very much. John, Morris? Yep. Um, first, I'd like to say that it's been a much better experience than I expected, so thank you for that. And, um, you know, uh, Alinsky, my favorite community organizer, defined a liberal as someone who walked out of the room before the argument began, so you're <laughs> saved on that score. Um, very, very briefly, just a couple of things. There's got to be incentives to virtue. We've got to think quite brutally about that. So uh, creating situations where people do the right thing, I think it's very important to make a distinction between your fate and your destiny i.e. what is wrong with the following sentence by Gordon Brown, it is the destiny of the Labour movement to save the banking system. I think, I think, um, I think he should have said it is the fate of the Labour movement, yeah. but our destiny yeah. lies elsewhere. Yeah. Um, just to go on, on globalisation, the big lie with globalisation is the place you live in doesn't matter. Um, that basically what, what matters is that you log on and you abuse a whole load of people who you've never met and you misunderstand what they say. So what I think is what's crucial now with this I completely clapped and applaud what the woman said. Democracy and leadership are linked. But what we've got now is, a, is an occupation of the City of London that has suddenly, at the bottom of that cathedral, suddenly said, where, where are we? We're in this completely undemocratic institution, the Corporation of the City of London. We want citizenship for, more, for all Londoners. I think this is an exact example of what I was trying to say, that we don't, we're not free because of our rational processes. We're free when we own the stories we inhabit in, inherit and we inhabit them and if there could be a story about renewing citizenship in the place that we live that, that would just be a wonderful, a wonderful thing so there's a really important thing going on now with this Occupy London and I just urge you to engage with it OK, thank you very much. Uh, uh, Bruno? Um, no, I'm, I'm very interested in the idea of um, virtue at the moment and, and, and I would see um, virtue in perhaps more Republican sense as coming from fighting dependency um, from fighting um, fate and coming from domination, yeah, indeed, yeah. from fate, from domination. And it comes from the fight, or virtue arises from the fight to independently um, define our own lives. And as Mill observed, as, as uh, uh, those who support the idea of the moral autonomy 
of the individual as part of the development of the individual, we see that that fight for independence pushes us into contact um, with others because no one wants to have a fated life. And I think without that balance, without the virtue of fighting dependency, domination and asserting our individualism, our independence, then the balance between society and the state and economy does get thrown um, out of kilter, as many people have described. Uh, thank you very much indeed. Clifford? There's a danger, Claire, that a consensus is beginning to emerge oh, if you God. don't intervene quickly to steer it away. Um, the, fact, the fact we haven't answered all the questions doesn't mean we don't take them away with us and think about them further. But just one point I'd like to raise. Yes, I have read Adam Smith and also his theory of modern sen moral sentiments, uh, which puts rather a different gloss on what he's getting at. The fundamental point seems to me to be that we are living in a culture that is dominated by economic forces, and that's not good for society, it's not good for the state, it's not good for the individual, and it's time we pushed back. Uh, thank you very much.